You're listening to Jet Nation Radio, the official podcast of JetNation.com. The largest independent fan site in the NFL. Be sure to check out our forums and talk all things Jets with thousands of other diehard Jets fans. Now to get you up to date on all the latest Jets news, notes, and quotes, here are your hosts, Dylan Terriman and Alex Varallo. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another episode of Jet Nation Radio. These are your hosts for the evening, Dylan Terriman and Alex Varallo. Dylan, how are we doing tonight? I'm doing really well, man. This is the third week in a row we'll have a guest on to talk with us, and this one's a special one. We're going to have, you know, former special teams coordinator Mike Westoff, who is a legend of the early, you know, 2000s era of football and special teams. He's going to come on and, and join us and talk with us. So I'm really excited, man. Absolutely. I'm very, very excited to speak with him as well. Um, have great memories, uh, you know, as a young man. Uh, growing up watching the Jets in the uh, early to late 90s, and then it was a really, really special time during that 99 season and beyond that time. And Mike came in right around 2001 and uh, was a fantastic coach and uh, definitely loved everything that he brought to the table for this team. And uh, I actually do see a caller in the studio right now, and I do believe this is Coach. So let's not hesitate and get the man of the hour online. Coach Westhoff, uh, is this you? Yes. Yeah, can you hear me? Loud and clear. And uh, thank you for coming on to uh, Jet Nation Radio. Very, very excited to speak with you. I'm happy to do it, guys. Happy to do it. Anytime. That's great. And, uh, you know, I've noticed that you've um, been collaborating um, within the last week or so. I believe you linked up with one of our very own Green Bean on a show on YouTube. And uh, that's really, really cool to see, uh, you know, that you're coming back into the Jets world here. Um, I must say, as a fan of yours and a fan of this team, I really don't feel like the special teams unit has been the same since you've left. And, uh, you know, I know that's a little shot out at the, the current roster right now, but um, it's, it's just how I truly and honestly feel. And, uh, again, I'm getting goosebumps talking to you right now, to be honest with you. Um Dylan, I'm going to let you lead it off tonight. I know you have a couple questions for Coach, so uh, let's get right into it. Yeah, perfect. Um, My first question ties right into what Alex was just saying, how we haven't necessarily been impressed with the team as a whole, but the one thing that has been constant has been special teams coach Brant Boyer, who they've kept on since 2016, which has been at least three head coaching changes now. And I was wondering if you – could just speak on what it takes to have a long career as a special teams coach specifically, and if you have any thoughts on Brant Boyer himself. Uh, yeah, I, have a, I, have, I drafted him. So I, I guess I know a little something about him. Uh, wow. When I, was, when I was in Miami, uh, I went down to the University of Arizona. He, was, he played there, and we drafted him and uh, made our football team and played for me. And then when Jimmy Johnson came in, uh, Jimmy let him go. And um, he went up to Jacksonville and went on to a nice career and then worked his way into the coaching profession. So I, I know him I, I know him very, very well. And um, I think he does a nice job. I have not really, you know, I don't, now that I'm out of the media, I don't study everything they do. I just kind of watch on television. But um, Brant's a good man, and he's done a nice job. And now to stay uh, with several coaches, um, sometimes it's just a matter of, of being good at what you do. It's not that hard. You know, the idea is, just to know, figure it out, know what you're doing, and, and, and be proficient. And then when you, you know, someone comes in and, you know, you say, well, you do what you hear. Here's where we are. Here's where we are. And this is what I used to do. You know, I said, I'm ranked right here. And, and, and so it, it was pretty easy for me uh, to do it. And so at first, done a nice job. And I, I think he'll, hopefully it'll, uh, it'll sustain and move on. They, they've got to, they've got to get their football team moving in the right direction. You mentioned early, or as you were introducing me, that the, like special teams haven't, haven't been, you know, you made a mention toward that. It's the team. They haven't, since I left, they haven't won anything. So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to take credit for all the winning that we did at one time, but I was sure as heck a large part of it and helped out. I, I know that. Mm-hmm. Was and uh, so, and it was fun. I love New York. I love the fans. I love my experience there. And, um, and I'd love to see them headed back. So hopefully 
they can get there. I think they're a little better prepared than they've been, and it should be a – if I were a New York Jet fan right now, I would have fairly high expectations. Not off the charts, but I would begin to believe that I'm going to see it move forward because it has not since uh, 2012 when I walked out the door. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's definitely an interesting tie-in between you and Brant Boyer uh, with the connection there. That's awesome. Uh, last week, he spoke to the, the press and spoke uh, specifically about losing some core special teams players, some tight ends, Ryan Griffin, Dan Brown, but that they were entering the 2022 season with the same punter, the same kick return and punt returner in Braxton Berrios, and what it looks like uh, the same kicker in Eddie Pinheiro, whether he wins the kicking battle or not, um, is yet to be determined. So it, how just, just how important is continuity on the special teams unit? I think everybody says continuity on offense and defense is a must, but they just seem to overlook special teams. So how important is it to get the same core group of guys back year after year in your systems? It's not, it's, believe it or not, I'm going to give you the answer you're not going to expect because it's not, it's not that important. You have to learn. when you're, you're going to be a good special teams coach, especially today in this day and age with the way rosters are configured today. They're configured much different than they were during my my time because you don't have as many plays. You still have as many special teams plays. They've watered it down to where the fact that it's uh, it's existent, but it's uh, it's headed toward non-existent if they're not careful. Um, you're not going to have you're going to have a little as far as continuity. It only needs to be a couple guys. Is that, that you have to have a system that you have in place that anyone can come in that's a good football player. Now they're all pretty good and come in and can have a chance to perform and be successful. That's the key, because you're not going to keep a number of those guys because they move on. Sometimes a guy moves into a starting role. He moves into a, 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 you know, a deal with a better financial deal with another team. And so you as a coach have to be prepared for that. So the, the continuity thing, you know, it's overrated. And so, I mean, I went to the New Orleans Saints. I, I didn't want to go. I didn't know anybody. I was working with the media. I was working in New York with the ESPN radio and SMY television, I was having a ball. And, and I got a call from the New Orleans Saints. I wasn't looking to go back. I never met one person in the building. I never met any. I knew who Sean Payton was. I knew who Drew Brees was. But I never met the, any of them. And they call, asked me to come back. They thought they had a good team, but their special teams weren't very good. Okay, so I took a chance. When I walked in there, they were ranked 31st. When I left, we were first. There's no continuity there. You got to figure it out. That's my title, of my book. I know you guys are going to talk about that because I wrote the book, and that's why I've been doing all these things. And it's a matter of understanding what you have to do to make something work. And and and, and you, I wish to goodness you could have a lot of continuity back during the '90s. You had more. You were able to keep more. But then things, times, then business has changed. I've had a number of calls this year already from some new head coaches in the National Football League that asked me how I believe a roster needs to be configured today. It's vastly different than when I was in the middle of what I did. And that's a very good coach. Those guys that did it are pretty smart, in my opinion, because they're, they're, they're getting out ahead a little bit. So, you know, I, I, know, you, I know he's happy because you've got some guys, and he should be. And that makes it even more important that pressure's on him a little bit more. But the, the fact that someone comes in new, you don't get to say, oh, well, you know, I don't have the continuity of baloney. I don't care. You better figure it out. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think just hearing him speak, you, you kind of get that vibe from him that he's going to figure it out with whoever he has in the building. Obviously, you're going to take whoever comes back as a continuity piece. So I think you kind of hear that reflected in him based on your answer there. So that's awesome. And then my last one here. A uh, bit of a more philosophical question, but uh, a lot of teams, uh, namely the Giants in 2020 under Joe Judge, used starters on special teams, and then it looked like the 49ers adopted it a little bit in 2021. And now it, I saw that the Packers might introduce it in 2022 into their systems. And I was wondering if you had any core philosophies or practices that you had, you know, that you had to follow no matter what, and if using starters was part of that philosophy. Sure. Anything the Packers will do would be an improvement over what they've done. So, I mean, that's just reality. Absolutely. They're, they're, they're horrible. <laughs> um, as far as that starters go, um, I always used them my whole career. Always. I mean, everybody, everywhere I ever, everywhere I ever went. 
But now you have to be smart. You, you know, you have to know. You don't use them all. You, you don't have to use them for every single play. You know, I'm used to, I, I used to use Jason Taylor and Trace Armstrong when I was at the uh, with the Miami Dolphins. They, they would rush the punter. Well, they're two of the best pass rushers in football. Well, how do you think some wing that weighs 230 pounds felt like having to block those two guys every play? So um, you don't. Know, you just have to know how to sprinkle them in. Use a guy here. Use a guy there. Only ask them to do a handful of things. A couple of plays here. A couple of plays there. I did it my whole career. I never. And no one. I had never had a problem with it. I mean, a lot of times when um, uh, you know Darrell Reeves did things for me. Reeves helped me when I needed it. You know, if you needed something, you know, sometimes a team would have a real good gunner. He'd say, "Mike, let me, let me go out and jam." Okay, go ahead. Let's go. So, you know, you use what you have to do, but you have to do, do it smartly. Because, you know, a guy's playing so many plays, you know, you can't just beat him up. You can't do that. And uh, But yet to have everybody in a role and to mix it in and to know how to do that, that's crucial. It's vital. And so uh, starters need to have a particular role. How many of them? I don't know. You see, some of them, they may not be as good. You know, I, used to, I used to get some linebackers sometimes, a great linebacker. But, you know, it's a different thing in special teams, especially back then because every kickoff was being returned and covered. That's not the case today. So he had to be more of an open field player. He might be a great player in an elevator, but put him, in the, put him out in the middle of the field, he was pretty average. So, you know, a lot of times it just uh, – well, sometimes there were starters I didn't want. They weren't as good as what I had. They weren't even close to being as good as what I had. And so, you know, so that, that sometimes is a misnomer. I like to – if they fit – then I wanted to use them. Jonathan Vilma, the great linebacker for the Jets, was one of, was really a really really good special teams player for me. I mean, he was tremendous at it. But I only had him do a few things. But what he did, oh my goodness gracious, was he good? You know, Jonathan Vilma one year covered every kickoff for us. There's still there, if you if you go out to, to St. Louis, there's a Ram laying out there in that building somewhere that didn't get out after Jonathan hit him. He's still in there somewhere. <laughs> It's only been so hard, <laughs> you know, and a clean shot, man. I mean, but that's the kind of, you know, you just have to have that kind of guy. And uh, so, yeah, but the key thing is be smart, know how to mix it in, get something that they, they can enjoy doing, make it important. Because, uh, you know, my argument used to be, oh, well, tell me the play that's not important. Go ahead, go let me know. I, I'm really anxious to hear it. And so, but now I'll give you a number. I, I wrote this in my book. I wrote a lot about this. Um, Okay, my, my first 30 years in National Football League, my first 30, uh, not counting, not counting field goals and PATs, not counting those plays, whether you kick them or defend them, okay? I averaged 22 plays a game, 22. Punts, punt returns, kickoff, kickoff returns, I averaged 22 plays a game. When I went to the New Orleans Saints, seven. It went from wow. 22 to seven. Jeez. Because now I'm not counting a kickoff for a touchback. Now I'm 74. I could run down on a kickoff for a touchback. It's ridiculous. It's just they've changed the game dramatically. So you as a coach better figure that out. You've got to figure it out. You've got to know how to play this. What plays or what are, situations are crucial. Where you have to win. Yeah, it's, it's nice if you have a great kickoff returner. Look at all the ones we had. You know, Leon Washington and um, – Brad Smith and Eric Smith and not Eric Smith, excuse me, Brad Smith, Joe McKnight, you know, and, and uh, mm-hmm. Chad Morton, all those guys. And then when I was at the Jets, my ten, my ten years there, my first ten years, I had nine, nine different guys that led the NFL in returns. Well, there's nobody touching that record. There's nobody because, in fact, you don't have any plays anymore. <laughs> you yep. don't have them. I mean, and, and I know mm-hmm. all those years when we were in the playoffs and we were in all those playoff games, we were a crucial contributing factor i'm certain of that i mean me i believe is even more than that but I'll, I'll i'll let it go with that so but starters yeah get the right guy put him in the right role absolutely crucial yeah absolutely and uh, okay. as you were mentioning some of those names i i had to think of a player on the current roster that is a core special teams player and justin hardy who you might not necessarily want to see on the field as a cornerback at his designated position but he makes you know, a, a decent amount as a, a just a core special teams player. So I think it is good to find that balance between starters and knowing how to use them exactly. And 
it's awesome that Revis will uh, jam up any, think, any gunner as well as a wide receiver. You, you, so. Justin Hardy, where, where do you think Justin Hardy got to start? Who do you think started, got him going? I, I did. I New Orleans, about to say, exactly. Where did he yeah. come from? He's the same. He played yep. for me. He's tremendous. I love the kid. I love him. He's a good player. He's good. Now, you've got to do the right things with him. Justin Hardy's a proactive player. Proactive. Mm-hmm. That means he's the guy you've got to shoot to the, always going hard. It's the same thing. He's not a reactive player. And you've got to understand the difference. If I, if, I were, if I were coaching him on defense, I could put him in one or two particular roles, make sure he filled in that role. He'd be, he's an X. He'd be a great blitzer. You just got to use him the right way. Is he a guy? Right. Does he draw Revis in covering? No, he's not draw Revis. But he's a good football player if you've got him in the right role. Justin's a good player. It's a good, it's a good analogy. Uh, no, I mean, he's, you know, he's, great, he's great for me. And he was part of that great unit that we had. Yeah, it hit all ties back together, all three questions. That's awesome. Coach, that's all I have. I'm going to pass the mic over to Alex. He has a couple questions, and then we'd love for you to plug your book and talk about it as much as you'd like. So thank you so much for your time. Yes, Coach. More than so, more. Um, I was I was looking over, you know, um, some of the history that you have online, and, you know, as you said in your uh, new book that's coming out, I believe uh, what I saw was a release date of July 12th. Let me help you one second on that. Yeah, July 12th, it's sure. released everywhere. It's released everywhere through Barnes & Noble, Amazon, everywhere. But everyone has bought it in this past month through the, through the publisher. So anybody can get, you can get it right now. Right. Deliver it right to the door. All you have to do is go into Mascot. Mascot Books, that's the publisher, Mascot Books. Put in the title, figure it out. It'll come right up. It'll pop right up. And then you can order it and they'll deliver it right to your house. So it's easy to get. And then all the different, you know, I, I got involved. In, I, I have someone that helps me, thank goodness, and, you know, Twitter and Facebook and all those things. And it's all in there of how to get it in order. It's, it's really pretty pretty easy. And I'm, I'm extremely proud of it because it's written a different way. It's not just me uh, telling my side of the story. But then we interviewed. Um, I didn't do the interviews. Barry Wilner did. He helped me with the – I wrote every word. But he can, I didn't want to interview the players. So you're hearing me tell the story, and then you're going to hear Leon Washington tell it. It's really pretty cool, and I'm, I'm extremely proud of it. And it will give people a really good insight into what a lot of the National Football League is really about. And, uh, and without pulling any punches, because I wasn't always the, the easiest guy to get along with. Uh, and so there will be a few people that won't buy it for Christmas gifts, but that's their problem. Because they're the ones that did it. <laughs> and they do, they do stuff, so don't, don't look at me. I didn't goof it up. You did but anyway, uh, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but uh, well, so, so good. that's why we love you, Coach, because you've never pulled any punches, and, and that's why I definitely have uh, a lot of respect for you. And I'm glad that I don't have to wait till July 12th now uh, to get this book because uh, I was actually putting it in my uh, my cart, and I was going to uh, pull the trigger. But now I know I need to go to Mascot and look for it there. So, everybody, you just they, heard it, they, they, go they, to Mascot. They'll deliver, they'll, deliver, they'll deliver it right to your door. That's excellent. So, so coach, in your 30-year career, I happen to notice that special teams was not the only uh, position group that you uh, were focused in on. You were also involved with offensive line um, mm-hmm. coaching and the tight ends as well. So my question mm-hmm. to you is, out of those three position groups that you coached, um, which ones did you find uh, the most challenging and uh, how did that experience of, uh, you know, working with the O-line and tight ends help you to be the great special teams coach that you are today? Good. That's a really good question. That's a, that's a real good question, actually. And I've been asked a million of them, and that's, that's one of them. That's very interesting. Um, you know, don't forget, uh, actually, I was a strength coach also, which I didn't want to do, but I, I did it because nobody had it when I first started, 1982 with the Baltimore Colts with Frank Cush. Um I, I had been, when I was a graduate assistant at Indiana University, actually I coached defense. I was coach, helping coach linebackers, and I was a defensive coordinator for our young kids. Okay. Then when I, I coached most of the time in college, I was an offensive line coach. That helped me in my coaching career with the discipline of return game. I designed all my kickoff returns after a, a principles and the premises of an offensive off-tackle running play. And I created a double team. Mm. I trapped. I set up a wall. The kickout blocks at that time were a wedge. 
whether it was three guys or two and three or, or two and two and one, however used to the rules. The backside cutoff had the same principles as a cutoff on an offensive running play and, and uh, then a counter off of that. And so that was all based on back on my offensive line uh, background. So I think that helped me a lot with that. As far as the most challenging, it was definitely special teams because when I started, special teams were, were, were kind of a misnomer. I mean, there were a couple teams, a couple coaches, you know, George Allen and some people like that, Marv Levy, that, that, that really kind of made a little bit of a niche where they emphasized it. But they, they really was just personnel. They really weren't – there was very little creativity. In fact, almost none. There weren't any coordinators. Really, no no coordinator. And, and so the thing was kind of divided up on a staff. And then there was also, though, as I found out, along with no cre- very little uh, innovation, there was no regulation. Really, hardly any. You could do anything. So we tried everything. So when I came along, you know, I, I, I took it over from a guy. Frank Cush was going to fire a guy that was his special teams coach. He didn't like him. He thought it was terrible. He's going to fire him. I talked him out of firing him, and I said, look, I'll take it over. Well, way to go, Mike. I didn't know anything. I didn't know a thing. I didn't have a notebook. The notebook this guy had should have come with crayons. It was terrible. And so here I am. Okay, I'm going to be a special <laughs> teams coach. So I started reading the rule book and figuring it out, and I learned in a hurry the percentage of the rules applied to the kicking game was off the charts. And so I designed a rule book and I started writing things up and studying and writing. And, and next thing you know, I had the job and then it just developed. And, and the, the more I learned, the more I tried. So then I, I know I also learned in a hurry that I was the only coach that basically had a timeout before every play. I had a timeout. All I had to do was use it because mm. on the sideline, you know, before the kickoff, kickoff return. The clock stopped. So I started drawing everything. I drew everything. Instead of having two kickoff returns, I'd have 12. All I had to do was stand in the huddle wow. with a nice neat drawing and say, talk to you guys. Okay, now, remember now, this time you've got this guy, da 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 And so we became extremely creative and very innovative. Instead of one kickoff coverage, I'd have seven or eight each week. So nobody knew who the hell, what the hell we were doing. We're going everywhere. And you were allowed. Now you're not allowed to do any of that. Today. All this. Roger Goodell was with me. He's quoted on my book. He has a very nice quote that he said about me. I'm very proud of it. But anyway, I was with them in Miami at a celebration of life for Don Shula. And, and, and he was teasing me. You know, and he, was, he said, Mike, he said, you're the last one that can complain about the rule changes. He says, because most of them are because of you. He said, we had to make them. <laughs> <laughs> he said, the crazy stuff that you did, you were killing guys. And so... You know, and I when I and I don't mean that by we were because I thought we played very very physically, but very fair mm-hmm. and very clean always. But you talk to anybody that played against us, we were tough. You better buckle your chin strap because these guys were tough, and I love that. Um, but we did it. But anyway, so it wasn't even close. What I had to learn, and I just had. But the, the the good thing was, the more I learned, the more I realized that I could do, and I just kept changing things and trying things, and I could I could do a whole bevelly. I used to give out, and I know people would think I'm, I'm, I'm full of baloney, which they, they don't like to think that, but I wasn't. Um, I used to give out every week an 80-page scouting report and game plan, 80 pages. Now, it was it was wow. a depth chart, scouting report, game plan, all of that. And all of it didn't apply to one person. You know, these guys had this part, these guys had that part, et cetera. Now, with the way the rules are changed now, I don't know. I think you can make a game plan, put it on the back of a matchbook. It wasn't so different. It's just different. It was a different time. And that's mm-hmm. what I wrote about. And it's, it was unique. I came along with that for that job at the exact right time, the exact right place. And that doesn't happen to everybody in their career. And I was fortunate that it did happen for me. And I took full advantage of it. And, and then I learned from other people you know, we'd all steal from each other. And of course, you know, I think most of them stole more from me than I did from them, but that's okay. And it was just fun. It was a fun thing to be a part of. And I'm very, very proud at how that part of that part of the game went and reached its all time highest prominence. It will never go back there. It's, it's been dissipated. It's down to a different level and it'll never go back to that point in time where it was because of the tremendous rule changes. Yeah, I must say so that it, 
it has changed tremendously um, throughout the years, and uh, I know that they're trying to do their diligence in protecting players, yeah. um, you know, from, from concussions and things like that. Uh, right. But it does seem a little disheartening uh, because we don't see as many big returns as we used to, and, uh, you know, they've altered it so much to where it almost seems like, you know, coaches like you are now handcuffed to, you know, a handful of plays, and, and you have to make those count. So I definitely can see, uh, you know, how trying that can be to, you know, put your impact into a game because there are certain times where, you know, games are won and lost by special team plays. And, uh, you know, due to the fact that you had said that you averaged 22 and now reduced to an average of seven, um, that really, really but, makes, yeah, was, you know, your job was much harder. Year. That was one year for me. That was one year for me. I would say that seven, mm. if you looked at really today, would probably be closer to 10, 11, 12. Seven, Got seven, it. eight. Gotcha. Anyway, okay. that for me, you don't forget with the Saints, you know, of course, it was, we were playing inside uh, so much. The lot, almost every kickoff was a touchback. So you eliminated all that. And so there, some teams would have a little bit more. But it sure isn't 22. It's just not. You don't have the plays. You just don't have them. They've taken a lot of that away. And uh, you don't just need punt, punt returns. You, now, I can ask you some simple question. Think back to last year. Just think for a second. Here's a question. When's the last time mm-hmm. you saw an NFL team punt out of their own end zone? Wow. Good luck. Well, the Giants That's a really, really good four question. From third and nine, so I don't think it, yeah, I can't remember many times it happened at all. No, it, it just don't. These are things you don't see any longer. The game has changed. It's dramatically changed. And it's important if you're a coach to know how that it's changed and how, how you have to keep up with it and what you have to do. The teams that stay on top of that, they've got to figure it out. They're the ones that usually with the pretty good record. They're the ones playing at the end of the year. They're playing in January. So they got to figure it out. That's what you have to do. And so I think when I came along, I was able to help figure out that part of the game and become a viable contributor that, that really made a difference in football games. And so, you know, that, that that's what I was so proud of and what I wrote about. And uh, when you hear the players talk about it, uh, they, they, they're, they're very, very adamant in their description of, of what we did and what they were a part of. So it's uh, something I was very, very pleased to, to have a chance to do. So, Coach, I'm, I'm quite curious here because um, most guys have, a, have their experience come from when they played as a kid or in high school or in college. And I want to know what your experience is before your time coaching and if you were involved in the game, um, how, what was your impact and, and what position did you play if you played? Um, just, you know, a question off the top of my head here that I came up with because uh, I'm always sure, intrigued sure. about, you know, where it all started. Yeah, I played. I, I played all the time when I was a kid. I grew up in a and uh, then moved to a suburb in, in, in Pittsburgh area. My high school was undefeated. We were one of the best in the state. I was the first sophomore. Uh, Wyoming on a full scholarship. I played there and I transferred to Wichita State. I, I played, I was captain player. Player. Uh, on the NFL. I went to several workouts. Um, you know, I didn't have the physical. I, I was I was to have been a type of lineman, but I was never big enough. I was big enough to be like a DB or a linebacker, but I wasn't good enough. You know, I was like I was like a lot of guys that I saw come in the training camps that I coached over the years. Uh, so uh, football was my, was my way to get an education. I came from a family of six. We lived in, I grew up in a row house. We didn't have much money. Um, everybody worked. I worked in steel mills when I was young. Uh, uh, there was nothing easy about the way I grew up. Um, you read my book, you'll see uh, how I did it. And it formed a, a basis for me. I started school very young. My parents were young when they were married uh, and, and, you know, sent me to school early, not knowing. So I was younger than everyone in my class, and it was uh, it was tough for me. So I had to figure it out. And football was a way for me. Uh, I became a good player. I wasn't a great player, but I was good. And, uh, and I loved it. And I, I learned if I knew how to do it correctly, and I was tough enough, and I was always in good shape, well, I could actually have some fun playing it. I didn't have to be the greatest athlete. But I, I could I could play this game, and then after I realized I couldn't, I didn't want. To, I had a you know, the Canadian League came to me and tried to get me to go up there and play, but I was tired and I was beat up, and 
enough was enough. I didn't make it in the NFL. I, was, I talked to some guys from Dallas. I, my, my NFL career lasted three or four minutes. They worked me out. <laughs> they said, see you later. <laughs> it was good. But, you know, then I went to graduate school at Indiana University. I was with Lee Corso and coached there. That's where I got started coaching. I got my master's degree in educational psychology. Uh, I, I became a good student. And, um, and I had great experiences with people that I ran into and I coached with and things with Bob Knight, uh, Woody Hayes. You got to read, read it, just read it because it's just fascinating. Wow. And, it, and it, and it formed a whole basis for me to become a coach. And all of a sudden Bear Bryant, what'd you, hear, what'd you read a story about with Bear Bryant that happened with me? It's unbelievable. It's true as could be. And with Don Shula working all those years with Don Shula, he's only the best guy I'd ever coached. I mean, he was he was, the, mm-hmm. he was the head coach mm-hmm. of the National Football League, not the Miami Dolphins. He was the head coach of the entire NFL. Believe me, he ran everything. He was the boss. And, and so I learned a lot, you know, and it, it became, you know, all of a sudden here I am in the middle of it and then how it developed and, you know, some things. And I, I had some tough times because I had some health issues I had to fight through. But I figured it out, and it never stopped me. Uh, yeah, I coached with a cane and things. Well, if you, if you saw the x-rays of my leg, you wouldn't even believe it because it's all metal. <laughs> Fortunately for me, I was in New York and had accessibility to Sloan Kettering, one of the greatest places in the world, and probably the best orthopedic surgeon <laughs> that there is anywhere in what he did for me. And it worked. It worked. So, But my background uh, was, was like that. It was a tough background. Read about it. You'll see. I grew up in a city. I was. I had to fight all along it. It was a tough neighborhood. Uh, football was a way out. It was the only education. No one in my family had ever gone to college, and I had one chance. I, was, you know, I used to work in a steel mill. I remember the guys telling me, get a scholarship, get out of here. Don't let me see you back here. Well, I did. <laughs> I did. Wow. I took their advice. I took their advice, and it worked. It worked for me, and and that's that's what I did, and that's how I began to form my life and uh, got my master's degree, and then, went to work and coached in college a number of places and got in the NFL very young at 33 years old and stayed, stayed for a long time and didn't make many moves. I didn't make many. Uh, and it was a lot of fun for me. And I'm extremely proud and feel very, very fortunate that I worked in what I think is the best job in the world. That was an awesome segment right there, and uh, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, learned a lot just right there about you and your character, and, and now I'm understanding a little bit more where you got that hard-nosed mentality and, and where that translated into the game uh, that you coached, and, and that was fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I have one last question for you, and then I'll let you go. And, um, you know, this is based off of a quote that I had saw when I was uh, looking into your, your new book called Figure It Out, My 32-Year Journey While Revolutionizing Pro Football Teams, Special Teams. Uh, NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell says, we called Mike Westoff the mad scientist, and he changed the game. How does that make you feel um, well, knowing that, you know, someone, you know, with his, you know, platform uh, thinks that you were the one that revolutionized special teams? No, he, he didn't say revolutionize special teams. That That's a misnomer. He never said that. Actually, the, the, the publisher said revolutionized. I didn't say it. They did. But Roger Goodell, I was at that celebration of life, and he was there was a group of us there, and he was talking about me, and he said that uh, they used to, he was teasing me a little bit about about being a mad scientist, and he said uh, Mike Westoff changed the game. And so that, to me, I'm, wow. I'm honored with that. Uh, and, and what he was referring to, was all the different things that I used to do and, and how many times that, that it got involved. And believe me, I spent a tremendous time down in, in, in when I was with the Jets. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I jumped on a train and went into Park Avenue and went up in that. Their, their old office was at 280 Park Avenue. Now it's across the street. And, and I, I went there many times. Mike Pereira and I became very close. And I, and I really spent a lot of time learning how to make my part of that game more advanced and better and how to change it. And, and Mike and I are very good friends and I, I have tremendous respect for him as, as an official um, and wrote about it in the book. But that's what, that's what Roger Goodell was talking about, that, that part of how hard I worked at it and some of the changes that I was able to help implement. And so, you know, the revolutionized the game. He never, he never said anything like that. That's, 
that's the publishers that, that oh, what they do that was when they publish they, they go it. through <laughs> and they, no that no that well thank you that's okay but you know I don't want to misquote somebody and he just went through you know they go through and they they read what people say and then they put that in the in, in the preview of the book so they write that part I don't write that or quote that what Roger Goodell was said that is that you know, he called he was he was teasing me with that mad scientist stuff and he was kidding me and then he said he, he changed the game and that's what he was referring to how I was part of that of that change and it was to me is a tremendous compliment uh, from someone of his stature I'm a I'm, I'm a fan of his I know some of the there are some coaches that aren't big fans of his I I personally like him a lot and I always and I think he does a great job so uh, and I think he's the head of the one of the great the great businesses in the history of the world because the NFL the NFL does a lot of things very well so anyone that uh, has been complimentary to me I'm I, I, I'm very very humbled and very grateful for that's great coach I really really want to thank you for for the time that you gave us tonight and, and sharing you know some stories with us and just a little bit of your background and everything like that um, I, I must say this has got to be one of uh, the best and the most exciting shows that I've participated in. Um, Dylan, I just want to give you one more opportunity if you have anything else that you want to uh, ask Coach before we let you go. I know you're a busy man, but, again, uh, really, really thankful that you were able to uh, share this with us tonight. Yeah, just just on a personal Mm -hmm. note, I just want to say thank you again because you are my first guest that I've booked on this show. And like Alex said, this is easily the best show that I've been a part of in my two years doing this podcast. So, you know, tremendous gratitude to you. And I'm just so happy that you were able to come on and talk to us and and please talk about your book one last time while you were answering Alex's first question, I was able to check out the book in its entirety on mascot books and I paid for it. It's coming to my house, right to my front door. So (laughs) just one last time, if you want to give us a, where to get it and everything and, we're super appreciative of you. That's that's pretty cool. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, it's uh, I wrote it. It took me two and a half years, almost three years to write. I wrote it during the pandemic. It's something I always wanted to do in my life, and, and I'm proud of it. I had a guy help me, Barry Wilner. I wrote it. I wrote every word. But Barry, who is a writer, he conducted the interviews. I did not want to interview the guys. He, you know, Sean Payton's interviewed lots of players. And, and, and so then he would he would record the interview. And then as I sent him material, then he would punch in, you know, how they, what they said about it, things like that. That's how we did, we did it. Uh, the book will be out everywhere July 12th. You can get it through Amazon, Barnes & Noble, anywhere. But right now, through the publisher, Mascot, M-A-S-C-O-T, Mascot Books. You put in the title of the book, figure it out, and then figure it out. I, I think people will enjoy it. I, I believe it's just a good story. No, it's not a it's not the hundred and sixty million dollar quarterback. It's not. It's the guy at the other end and what he did. Now yeah, I'm I'm a little critical of some people and I and I'm very complimentary of most. But uh I love the opportunity to do it and I love my, my, my time in the, the league. And I was very, very pleased. I mean my time in New York was maybe as I look back was maybe the best time of my life. It was incredible. I I I loved it. The people were the greatest, and I wish we could have. We were so close, and I, you'll mm-hmm. find out how I feel about how we changed it. But I wish we could have gone one more. But you guys have, have done a nice job. You, you, I, I've, I've, I've participated in quite a few of these, and uh, you, you guys are sharp. You have good questions, and you were so. I'm, I, I, I'll take my hat off to you. You've done a nice job. Thank you. Oh, Th- thank you, thank, thank you. you. That, that, means, a that lot. means a lot. Yeah, that that's really yeah. awesome. And and again, we really, really do um, appreciate your time. And and I'll just say this now: anytime that you would like to come on to our show, if you have something else that you're working on or you would like to promote, uh, mm-hmm. we would be glad to uh, have you at any point in time. So uh, you know, you please know, you uh, don't, don't ever it. hesitate you to reach out. Yeah, I'll I'll give you one. I'll throw one out at you for kicks. You know, I'm gonna you get right before training camp, right as the Jets get ready to go to training camp. The book will be released then. I'll be in New York. I'm going to talk. I'll be on a number of shows. I'll be at ESPN and doing some things then. And I'm, I'm going to go to Jeff's training camp. I'm going to go up oh, and visit. Then excellent. maybe afterwards, maybe afterwards, I can come on with you and we talk about all that. Oh, oh that'd, that'd be great. That like a plan yeah. to me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'd be happy to and do hopefully it. hopefully I'll be the, book, the book's out then. The book's out everywhere, so that's a good way to publish publicity for me. 
and and I'd be happy to answer your questions and tell you what what I see or how it looks. And it's not, you know, I, I've been on the field for a lot of times in my life. I coached 657 games, so I have a little bit of a feel for it all. <laughs> and I'll be happy to share that with you. That's great. Uh, hopefully, That's Alex great. and I will be at some of the training camps too. So if we could chat it up there as well, everything would be great. That's that's awesome. Well, come and find me. Thanks, guys. Good talking to you. Thank you so Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Have a great have a night, night. Coach. Okay, guys. Good night. Be well. Wow. All um, right. Dylan, I'm almost at a loss for words here. Uh, yeah, that was for sure. pretty awesome. And now I'm going to try not to – I'm going to hold down the fanboy inside me from from jumping out of my seat here. But uh, that was really exciting and uh, a lot of information to uh, take in there about, you know, the impact the coach had on the game, you know, how things have changed from when he was with the Jets to, you know, current um, gameplay right now. And, uh, you know, even gave us a great story about his past, which was really, really cool. So um, really, really, really enjoyed all of that. Um, mm-hmm. 100% glad to have him on. And, um, you know, I uh, forgot to do this earlier, um, but, you know, thanks to uh, Mike Westall for joining us tonight. I would also like to thank uh, Miles Social mm-hmm. uh, for their support for Jet Nation. Uh, if you're a business owner and you're looking to improve your social media status, uh, please go to Mile Social and see how they can improve your company today. Uh, Dylan, do you have any uh, parting words or anything like that as we go to close the show tonight? No, I mean that was that was amazing. Truly, the best podcast that I've I've been a part of since I've been here, and uh, it was it was that easy to to check out his book. It took me three minutes. I, he wasn't even done answering your first question, and I had it checked out, ready to go. It, this, this is awesome. I can't wait to read it. It's on my summer reading list. That and uh, another book called Collision Low Crossers that was gifted to me, which covers, I believe, the 2009 and 2010 Jets seasons from an inside view. So he's part of those teams, too. So I'll be reading all about Mike Westoff in the summer and you know, hearing that he'll be at camp and we can meet him. That's going to be great, and I can't wait to have him on and just – truthfully you just can hear it i'm just so excited right on right on all right well everyone thank you so much for uh tuning in tonight we really do appreciate uh coach westoff joining us and giving us his great story um everybody please don't forget to go to jetnation.com download the app get involved in the forum it's one of the most active forums in the nfl uh we are also making some waves on youtube uh, Green Beans always collaborating. We've got Glenn Naughton out there doing special interviews and plugging out special videos as well. Uh, so don't miss out on what Glenn's doing. Um, he may not always be on with us here, but he joins us every now and again, and he's doing a little bit more of a bigger scene on YouTube. So definitely go check out Jet Nation on YouTube. And uh, don't forget to download our app. It's all free, editorials, videos, and, of course, direct access to jet nation radio so everybody thank you so much for tuning in please like and subscribe and as always everybody have a great week let's go jets thanks for listening be sure to follow us on twitter at jet nation radio glenn is at ace fan 23 and alex is at ny jets life 24 until next time go jets